Good morning. It's a tough act to follow after Dr. Mish. Uh, just to tell you, Dr. Mish was uh, a faculty here at NYU. He I was a junior faculty when he was here, and he was revered and loved. And we will hope that he will come back, as we spoke in California. So hopefully, he will do that. Uh, <clears throat> What a topic to talk about, periimplantitis. After he showed you how much bone he can grow, I'm here coming to talk to you how you're going to lose that bone. <laughs> so it is depressing. But before we get into that uh, note, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you at NYU. And how many of you are graduates of NYU? See, there you go. Welcome back. I'm, uh, yeah, good clap for them. <laughs> I'm as NYU as it gets. I'm from top to bottom, even I put my pin. I've been here 23 years, and there is a reason why NYU is what NYU is. NYU is actually the biggest school in the United States. It has 1,500 uh, dental students, so it graduates every year between 360 and 380. So I don't know how they all find a place, but they will all find a place all over the world. And it is an amazing place. On top of it, you have to count the 120 postgraduate students. So you can imagine, plus the international programs that we have, so you can imagine how many people enter this building and how many people exit it on every day. Over 300,000 patient visit. It is a happening place. It is a beautiful place. So NYU is very, I'm very grateful for NYU. It made us. NYU makes us. We don't make NYU. And NYU is going to be forever and ever. And we welcome you here. This is where we are. And there is another building on the side. It's Wiseman. And there is the new addition that if you have had the opportunity to visit it, and hopefully we'll have more symposium using it over there, it is actually the home of bioengineering, dental school, and uh, biomaterials, and the nursing school, which on the 11th floor here, there is the most superb room you can ever find. We'll see if we can get it. So uh, having said all of that, if you want to know how NYU, how important, just come in May, and you can see the Empire State Building turns purple. Having said all of that, it is actually an honor to be here and an honor to be with you, because it reconnected me with a lot of faces that I haven't seen for a long time. Even friends, even Hisham, who took one of our residents back to Louisiana, and Christian, my classmate, and many, many, many others that I can spend the whole day talking about them. Uh, but on top of it, I do have a full-time practice, so I don't have a life. But the most important thing is these people, these young men and women that uh, we dedicate our life for them. And we spent uh, three years with us full time. So we are the biggest program in the nation, it's 27 of them. So you can see what a challenge it is. So what is the philosophy of education that we give them? And that is my philosophy, is how can we educate them in the learning of facts, not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind. And I wanna continue what uh, Dr. Mish have uh, talked about it, which is very important. We are learning a lot of techniques. Do they work? They don't work. What's the effect in long term? Not six months, not one year. What about 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And that is what's the very important thing that we need to know. Why I'm saying that, I want to start with talking about periimplantitis, because periimplantitis is an enigma. An enigma because it is, the diagnosis is difficult. And it's not like periodontitis, you can take the perioprobe, and we will talk about that, and you make a good diagnosis about it. It is multifactorial, probably, but also it goes back to one point, is if we know how to diagnose a problem had happened. And when we talk about that subject, so I want to give you this quote, the pessimist, the optimist, and realist. And we have to be realistic that this problem is going to happen. Eventually, it will happen. I see it often in my practice. I've been 17 years in my private practice, and I've seen it a lot. Because the population is increasing. And the most important thing, it is increasing in the third bracket. And that is a very important, because people like my age, in the 46, 47, are going to live longer, and they're going to have implants. And those implants are going to live longer. So you can buy the most expensive car. If you don't maintain it, it's going to break. What about the implants? So, and you can see the trends. The trends are increasing. The money is there, so the industry is pushing it. That's why we have more and more implants placed. It doesn't mean that it's wrong to place it and only specialists have to place it, none of that. I've seen it happen with both. But what I'm saying is that when we put the implant, it's like a marriage with kids. We can't divorce. You have to be married to them. So you put an implant, you have to follow the implant. 
And I remember uh, two weeks ago in California, Dr. Mish was talking about when he asked you, Steve, about the overlap, and I put one just for that. It is true. He said, I'm a surgeon. I put the implant. I don't see them. Well, in periodontal maintenances, we see it. It happens. And especially the alternating, and now we are going into a trend. No, we should not enter, alternate periodontal maintenances. But periodontal maintenances, which is an implant maintenance, it is in essence, and that's how we're going to go into that. So what is periimplantitis? Is it an infectious disease? Is it a, an implant design? Because if you see the last article in Jomi by Simeon, is saying that the surface of this implant is wrong. That's, that's not true. And the failed treatment planning. So what is it? Well, one has to start by looking at what my experience was with periimplantitis. In 1997, I'm not like Romanos, he started in 94, but in 1997, I was brand new out of the program, and I used to get my first job across the hall here in continuing education. And my job was, if you remember the movie, The Schwarzenegger, uh, The Eraser, that was my job, is to clean up HA. And HA was supposedly that bad thing that happened, which is not. But when we had the HA, it was very typical defect. I was trained in pure titanium, you had to put sunglasses to look at the implants when we took it out. In reality, we got to this hydroxyapatite, and now every implant is roughened. What is true and what is wrong? Is the implant design, is only HA or everything? Well, in reality, now everything is roughened all the way up to the neck, even above the neck. So the question is, how can we maintain them? Because this is going to happen. So it is happening with everything mundanely. This, like this case, when they started having some defect here, they missed it, and it kept going until they sent it to me just two days before my birthday, many years after. And when they got it to me, it was like this, inflamed past all the good stuff, all the cardinal point of inflammation. Now, when you treat this, that's what you're going to see, and that, unfortunately, you can't do anything about it other than explanting it, but look at the amount of damage that happened by misdiagnosing it. Look at this one. So this patient came to me, one of the implants were exfoliated. I asked the dentist to send me his uh, x-rays. And when he sent me the x-rays, look at this. For every mandibular tooth, they replaced it with an implant. On top of it, look at the periodontal condition that is happening. But this is a full reconstruction as we speak. Or this is one of my favorite. Favorite, I don't say it's favorite because it's a heartbreaking, as he said. When you deal with complication, it's not fun. And this patient comes to me just before Thanksgiving, sublingual inf uh, inflammation. I took a comb beam, look at this. I couldn't do anything. I sent her immediately to the hospital. This needed to be IV'd. But think about it. I asked the dentist to send me the x-rays. January 2013, January and November. Look at the black. That, and look at the bone. The bone was still there. It could have been prevented. So let's now immerse in that periimplantitis. Did I shock you enough? It's not my job to shock you, but just to tell you this is real. So I'm sorry, I'm losing all the bone that you build. Now, <clears throat> we have two terms, mucositis and periimplantitis. And when we talk about mucositis, it is the inflammation of the soft tissue without touching the supporting bone, without supporting bone. Now, when we go to periimplantitis, it is an inflammation, but reaching down to the supporting bone. So this is the terminology that is different. And Maurice yesterday said the ailing, which used to be called on our time, and nobody talks about it anymore. But in reality, it is an ailing, meaning a sick implant. But they call it periimplantitis. So what's the prevalence of periimplantitis? Because recently we were with the tri school and Ernesto jumped on it. No, it's not true, it's not that high. But the literature is saying it is high. If you look at the mucositis, which is, was typical of the Brennemark, pure titanium, it was 50%. When you look at the prevalence of periimplantitis, you can see it ranged from 15 to 40. It's all reported all over the literature. But it's true, it is there. The question becomes, is it only particular to a certain systems, as Simeon just said it. Well, no, I have to disagree. And it is all across, all across the systems. Because once you have a roughened surface, you're going to have it. Now the question becomes, how rough is rough? Now how long is long? 
how rough is rough, and that becomes a big problem. Actually, two of my students, when they were going to present in their tri school, they did a PubMed, Dr. Abid and Dr. Sultani, and they said they found that it's in actually when they did it, up to 730 art 38 articles and counting that has been published about periimplantitis. Even myself, I've did two papers on that. And in this last one, I defined the factors leading to periimplantitis. Well, you have them in chronic, early stage of healing, and iatrogenic. And when you look at chronic, you have history of periodontitis, poor oral hygiene, which combine both, tobacco smoking, as he said before, and control diabetes or any systemic disease that influence their immunological or their host response. Early stage of healing. And that is very interesting because the biological width, the implant design, this is when it gets into that platform switch or we're gonna lose uh, crystal bone or not. I have news for you, we're gonna have crystal bone. So get over it. Tissue thickness and keratinization. Huh? Is the two millimeter that Linkovich is saying or we have to increase it more? And what is the impact on it? Bone quality, immediate implant, history of endodontic failures. And lastly, the poor treatment planning and the excess cement. Well, this is more than 30 minutes. I'm not gonna do like George Roman who's gonna hold you on that. But I'm not gonna go into all of that. So I took a little bit of a summary of what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about these four or five points. And the first two are very dear to my heart. And whomever been my student or been around, ever heard me talk, I am very adamant about the probing. Adamant negatively, not positively. Why? So let's talk about that. Well, around an implant, we have the same histology. We have connective tissue and epithelium. That's true. But when it comes down into the, down into the bolts and the nuts of the connective tissue, there we see the differences, which is the collagen fibers. They don't connect the same way. And if we look at this beautiful picture, and I don't know how many of you love sailing. How many of you love sailing? Nobody is a sailor? Now, I love sailing. I've, since I took the job at NYU, I haven't done a lot of things. So you, it looks like an anchoring of a boat on the marina, right? This is how the ligaments hold the tooth inside. There is subcrestal and there is supracrestal. So let's focus a little bit on the supracrest. So when you're probing, my friends, this is the cushion that holds it. That cushion is made out of five. Guess what? When I start with the first year, I bombard them with questions about that because we forget about all of that. So this is the cushion. And the probe around the tooth does not cross the junction epithelium. That is in health. Now, let's look at how we probe. When we're probing, we have a certain force. When we increase that force and the tissue blench, the patient is gonna smack you on the face because it hurts like hell, right? So the question is, is it similar around an implant? I've published three chapters in that book and we talked in, in, in depth about the soft tissue and uh, periimplantitis and, and also about the soft tissue management, but look at the difference between them. One has the, just the fibers down to the bone with nothing here, one, it has this humongous amount of anchors that is holding the soft tissue to the tooth. Now, this is what Lindy said in 1993 in his book. If you see his recent uh, publication, this picture is gone. But it still says the same thing. He said that if you take a probe and you probe around an implant, you get to 0.2 millimeter from the bone. And when you take out that probe, guess what? It's going to bleed, right? There's the two things that we do, probing and bleeding upon probing. When we look at 1998 or 97, when Mombelli talked about probing forces, you can see the more you put force around an implant, the more that probe number increases. Around the tooth, as I showed you before, they will smack you on the face because it hurts. It stops at 0.75. Again, let's look at what they talk in the literature. Cho, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, <clears throat> said two things. A probing measurement at implant and teeth yielded different information. Small alteration in the inflammation around an implant will get a deeper measurement. Now the same group of Lindy, Abrams and Soldini, wanted to talk about probing. 
and they wanted to sell us the probing. Now let me go back to the one before. What kind of machine they used? They used an electronic probe that they controlled the force. Now let's go to Soldini and Abramson. They put a normal force, they called it a light force, 0.2 Newton. You know what's a 0.2 Newton? It's like caressing. Uh, how many of you will be able to do that? And they still, with that, they found that a little bit of inflammation around an implant, you're going to get more depth of probing. But the most important thing, let's look at the literature, at, at their article, at their histology. And that's what I would like you to do. When you take an article, just don't take the conclusions. Read the article and see what's right and what's wrong. Look at this. They are telling you that the probe around a tooth and around an implant is the same way. First of all, let's see. Look at this Im uh, emergence of that tooth, right? Look at the implant. Have you ever seen an implant without a crown on it? And you're probing on it? We see these big crowns, and we're going to probe underneath them, right? So how can you have the same similarity that we see in reality? Second, take a look at the anchors here. Look how much the tissue is pushed. Look how much these collagen fibers are working. Look at here. The collagen fibers are here. All of this is unsupported. You put a little bit more pressure than 0.2, guess what? You're going down to Chinatown, <laughs> down to the bone. <laughs> now, you have to say it. I love that film. I mean, New York, Robert De Niro came. Right? So now, let's get some inflammation. You got an inflammation around the tooth. Guess what? We forget that we learned all of this in dental school. This is the inflammation. Look what's holding that inflammation. It's the collagen fibers. That's what holds it. That's what delays the inflammation from rapidly going down to the bone. Now we take the same thing and we compare it to an implant. Guess what? This inflammation is going where? Down to the bone, down to Chinatown. So this is the problem. The more, the, as soon as you get an inflammation around an implant, if it is not taken care of, it's going to fly down straight to the bone. So in summary, if you look at this also, you can see that Moon in 1999 said actually something more even further scary, that there is two zones of soft tissue around them. And when you look at the zone A and zone B, zone A, which is in contact with the implant, this is the one that is in contact with the implant. So imagine here the bacteria coming, and this is depleted from all vessels. It's all scary tissue. And we know if you have a scary tissue, it's a dead tissue. There's no response to plaque. When you put the plaque inside, it's going to get straight down. So there is a reason why the tissue around an implant does not tolerate inflammation. So if we want to summarize it, probing around an implant doesn't have the same value as around natural teeth, unless you want to sound the bone. Connective tissue around an implant is scary by nature, which provides a compromised host response. So there we go. We are starting with the wrong negative environment that cannot tolerate inflammation. So let's go to iatrogenic factors. And this is what we recognize our own mistakes. Let me start with this one. This one here, you can see that tissue, purple, inflamed. But when you open it, look at this. Look at the souvenir that they left when they put that crown, right? This is what we talk, and you see the trend going back into screw retained, now for it or against it. I'm not here to discuss that, but these are the reasons, and they don't look, you cannot see them on an x-ray. Now, let's look at this one. I love this one. They love the ring on it, right? That's a ring. And that's what happens with the bonded material. You see it a lot with them because you can't see them on an x-ray. Now, look at this one. I, I don't know how much cement they put inside, but, but what happened is you couldn't see it, and it stayed there, and it festered, and the inflammation went down to the bone. So is it all? No, even the crowns. And that's what he wanted you to talk about, Steve, and that's that overlap. When you have a ridge overlap, the plaque builds underneath it, and immediately it gets inflamed. And when it gets inflamed, we know it goes straight down to the bone. Or this one. Look at this overlap that before I even opened the flap, I had to trim that overlap. And then after I trimmed it, as you can see, you can see the amount of bone destruction that took place on the implant. So this is, in summary, what we can cause and we, how we can prevent them. 
So the question becomes, is periodontitis or periodontal history or periodontal disease has anything to do with the influence or influence the periimplantitis? Well, if you look at this one, and we can see from 1989 to even 1997, bacteria will form, the normal bacteria will form around an implant immediately as soon as you expose it or you put the implant into the oral environment. Now, the question becomes, if it is harbored by the pathogenic bacteria that we have in periodontal disease. This is something that Liz Carden talked about it in the beginning of time, and then it's been repeated in 2006 and 2007 and 2008. So yeah, when we have a periodontal disease and we put an implant, guess what? They're gonna cross-contaminate. They're gonna the same body. Now, the recent statistics in the United States, it's scary actually, in, 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 in the developed, I mean, in an in in industrial country like the United States, that you can see we have 47.2% of periodontitis, and it varies from moderate to aggressive. So you can see this is something we have and we are living with. And what we did in periodontics, we blocked the bacteria in color shape, like when we had them at the time of security zones, you know, the red is the bad, and the, the orange that is okay, but is bad, and the green is acceptable. And then, let's look at what's the impact has been reported of these bacteria on the implants. You can see Shibley, he said that the red complex and the orange complex are in cause or etiological for the inflammation around an implant. Now you can see Quirinen, he said actually even worse, and I disagree with what George said, which is a good friend of mine, yesterday, when you extract all of the teeth, it doesn't mean that you eliminated all the pathogen in the oral cavity. What they said, that you will still have AA. Now I'm not gonna spell it because it's such a complicated thing. I've been in periodontics for over 23 years and still don't know how to say that word. But this is evident that it stays into the mouth. That's a new evidence. Now, Monge said that patients with aggressive periodontitis have four times higher risk of failing implants. This is real. Now, let me share with you this case. This case I treated in my private practice. She came to me with periodontitis, aggressive periodontitis, but she was in her 50s, so I can't tell what, what's her history, how long she had it, and so on and so forth. And when you do the whole documentation, then you look at the x-ray, definitely, you know, we have a problem. So we've decided to move into implants, and we planned it properly like we all do. I'm just showing you that I did the right thing, and I planned it properly, and I went and I executed it properly, all the implants on the bottom, I was so glad about it, and the top, and, you know, we waited, and I did the temporization on the top, and then later on, she went to final, and she was happy, she was... You know, it's a success, right? And that's the extra. Five years later, she shows up. Things immediately, when I looked at her mouth, you can see something is going wrong. Immediately, the tissue is inflamed all over the place. And when you look at the x-rays, you see that. So what happened? That's the big question mark. What happened? What happened in the long run? Don't show me six months and a year and this technique and that technique. How am I going to live with this? five, ten years. It falls into the same consensus that they published in 2001 that they said in five years the complications start knocking on your door. Now, I have a student of mine, I don't know if he's here, sucker, so I was excited, he got this case and he was just thinking about the implants. He would just want to take those implants and build them and this patient came from private and I know the periodontist that placed them and he's a, he's a decent guy, he didn't do anything I think wrong, but look at her mouth. I said, well, wait a second. Before we just start pumping new bone regeneration augmentation, I said, let's do a microbiological testing, and that's how it happens, and we sent the Temple University. I know some of the Temple people are here. And then you look at it, and that's after the cleaning that she had, preparation, you know, maintenance. She still has high numbers in orange complex. That is scary. So that's something that you have to keep in mind before venturing into an extensive treatments and stuff like that. And that brings me to the last part of the presentation. How can we manage periimplantitis? Well, <clears throat> management of periimplantitis has been a, uh, 
The good thing is I, I don't want to do a lot of uh, systematic reviews or uh, all of the articles, but if you look at it, everybody has their own magical potion. Everybody has their own technique. And this one does this, and that one does that. And everybody says it works. Huh? And they all of them probe. And they tell you, I'm probing. It's good. Well, I showed you the probing is wrong. Now, how many of you probe around an implant? Don't be shy. You not because I said it, you know. We're not in a classroom. <laughs> so, and why do you probe? It makes us feel good, no? Because we're probing. Because we, as a dentist, we are slave of numbers, right? He was talking about, I'm sorry, I'm picking on you too much, Craig, but we love you. So if three millimeters here, when yesterday, the beautiful Japanese worker was telling you about the preppings and how beautiful it is, and it's, there is norms, one millimeter, 1.5, reduce it from here, do it from there. We are slave of numbers. We love numbers. We live off of numbers. We talk numbers, right? This is us. But in reality, it's not what implant is. Implant is you need to read the soft tissue, read to know, accept that it's going to happen, and we need to deal with it. So since 1997, I had these theories that I wanted to do. How can I disinfect? And you can see from the beginning of time, and I will forget it, I was a fresh student, was 23 years old, and Dennis Tano came in, and I didn't know who he was. And he was this guy with this big afro, and talking so smart, I was so impressed. Actually, I came for another program. I went to his program. So that's, that's how much I was influenced. And he was right. And he was telling us about the story about when Calcitec came about, and they started doing in California all of this hydroxyapatite. And all of a sudden, all of them start breaking down. And it was, a fresh, it was fresh. It was 1993. It was frightening to, uh, to hear that. And that's true. From the band then, they were talking about it. And then. <clears throat> The goals of treatments, what are the goals of treatments? Because this is where it becomes the problem. You know, everything is a technique, but what are the goals of treatment? Well, definitely we have to control the bacterial etiology. Anytime you lose bone, you expose the roughened surface, that surface is contaminated. End of the story. It doesn't matter now what caused it, it is in fact. Second is you have elimination of the inflammation, Thirdly is you have to decontaminate that surface. And after you do those three, then you have to approach, how can I fix what has been damaged? Either by resective, which that's what we do in Perio, and that's what he showed you yesterday, and or by regenerative approach, which we used to call a GTR here. I don't know what you're going to call it. And the question becomes, that surface that the bone has grown on it, is it re integrated That takes us back in periodontics about the GTR. Did we grow bone or we fill the bone? And until you do histology, you can't say anything. So bottom line, this is the goals of our therapy. And the good thing is some people promote the non-surgical therapy. It's good. But does it do the job? Does it do the trick? One of them is a teacher of mine, Dr. Fletcher. He talks about how can you rinse around the sulcus and use the uh, basically bleach on a reduced environment. Some of them tell you that we put local antibiotics. Some of them takes the laser and on and on and on and on. So the question becomes, what's the literature said? I'm not going to talk much about it, but I'm going to show you one thing, that the bacteria drops down and the bacteria jumps back up. Two people proved it, Mombelli and Person. It goes down and goes back up within six months. Why? Because the surface is still Contaminate it. Unless you decontaminate the surface, you can't deal with it. So what, what the literature has said, you can look at Subramani, and they did a systematic review, and every time we do a literature review, the student hates systematic reviews because you have to read so much about it. It's boring. And I admire Craig that he collected them because this is the truth. You have to review everything has been talked about in that subject. And Subramani has said, both mechanical and chemical debridement, still the consensus still now on cleaning or decontaminating the implant. Yet they mentioned that there is photodynamic or lasers have been shown some small beneficial results, not proven because there's no study that has been done about them. Meaning what we did in periodontics, take split mouth, compare and see where we are. And lastly is, 
the one by Anna, talks about the same thing. And then if we move forward, we see that we did a poster about our uh, uh, results, and it's been uh, picked up by JP. And what we did is we took the chemical, we treated them, and we looked at them on SEM. We took the mechanical, and we looked at them at SEM. Everything that is available. So we looked at the saline, because a lot of people promoting by just rubbing saline, you're going to solve the problem. Look at it. The biofilm is intact. When you look at chlorhexidine, the same story. When you look at citric acid, same story. When you look at phosphoric acid, again, the same story. Now, when we moved into mechanical or implantoplasty, when we took birds and we did them, and you can see the difference. You can see how polished it is, and I love this picture because it depicts where the biofilm is still there and where you cleaned it. So the difference. But the problem is it brings it back to a polished surface. We tried the, the Profijet, and look what happened with the Profijet. The Profijet left quite a bit of biofilm, and on top of it had a buildup of its own, uh, 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 the powder of it. And when we looked at the titanium brush, it did a lot of the cleanup, but still some were left. When we did the laser, and just to show you that we did that, and look how much we put the beam on it, uh, and yesterday Romano showed that it might be destroying the implant, I don't know, but it didn't show on our study, but if you look at the result of this and that, still did not clean completely. So, and if you look at, again, the, the apical part, you still the same, the same thing. So bottom line is, you need to do a mechanical and you do need the chemical because you have to disturb that biofilm and then you have to somehow destroy the inflammatory or the protein in it. So to move forward, and I don't want to keep the, the lecture behind, so this is the, the one that I suggest as the treatment, and I'm going to run you with four cases quickly. And this is my kit that I use. I use a, a, for polished carbide, fine and fine composite. You can buy them anywhere. Phosphoric acid, the same one you use for composite. I follow the same topography that we do in periodontics. And if you look at this case, <coughs> you just open the flap, you decontaminate the surface, you put your bone, after you put the phosphoric acid for one minute and you rinse it, you close it up, and again, it is three years behind. You can see the post-op about it. It's maintained and it's living. She it comes every three months to my office. Now, this is a, a actually a beautiful case. You can see here when we opened, the same thing as in periodontics. You have a two-wall defect. We cleaned it. <clears throat> Phosphoric acid, one minute. Bone, GTR. And we closed it up. And that is a five and a half years post-op. And that I can show you the extra five years. And if you want to compare the before and after, you can see how maintained it is. And it's very acceptable results. Now, <clears throat> when you go to this one, and this is a full rehab. I couldn't get one implant out, opened it. Again, I did an aggressive implantoplasty because it's outside of the bony housing. And phosphoric acid, one minute, you clean it up. Bone same thing as we do in periodontics, but here I added the connective tissue as you talked about it, Maurice, and I closed it up. And I love this because this is a long four years follow-up on that case. It's solid, it's healthy, it's going well. And lastly, this is the case that I've started telling you about periodontal history, and you can see we open. Now I'm less aggressive in my implantoplasty the phosphoric acid, and you can see less of the aggressivity, not to remove the threads, but just to clean in between them to remove that and get the shining in. Then put the bone and connective tissue. And if you want to do connective tissue, don't be shy about collecting connective tissue. All right? And then you put it in place, and then that is the follow-up. So finally, the, the recommendation that I can give you is that, ah, one more case, I'm sorry, I'm rushing to be on time. <laughs> so this, when you remove it, again, this is what uh, uh, Greg was telling you, is you have to do titanium. I, I share with him a lot of the, 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 the passion about the bone grafting. This is with the uh, pure uh, allograft with recombined BMP2. We open, place an implant, but when I go to place the implant, is never enough bone. 
Don't be shy on regrafting because that bone is going to start resorbing after you drill to your osteotomy. And I did add a soft tissue on it with an allograft and the closure, and that is a three years follow up on that case. So finally, what are the recommendations? You have to decontaminate the implant. You have to treat the periodontal disease. You have to put the patient on periodontal maintenances. And if you have to deal with it, it's not the probe as much as it is the soft tissue reading. And finally, you have to do open flap debridement, GTR, and osseointegration. That is something we will see. And I ended always with, they call it the Shaharism, is like a little bit of <laughs> my recommendation. Have you seen this building? You are here. 23rd Street, the flat iron building. I love this building. This is the first tower ever built in the world, 1902. Everybody, every tourist, every citizen of New York take a picture of it, is in love with it as much as I take it from every corner. The reason I say that, because it's built with passion, built on fundamental that never shakes. So the really, if you want to be successful, follow the same model, and you can see that if you have, you live with your fundamentals, it's never changed. Biology will always win. And finally, set your goal properly and then walk your way back. And I cannot end it better than Steve Jobs when he said, you can't connect the dots unless you look back and see what you learned from your mistake and you move forward. I want to thank Dental XP for inviting me. I hope it was not too depressing. And hope to see you again.